in Germany, in our church. Father, we thank you for the technology that you've given us that we not only can reach the people here, but we can also reach out over the internet into other nations. And Father, out of obedience to you, we study what your word says about our time. Father, I pray that Holy Spirit on the inside of every believer would give revelation of these scriptures that we study and the series that we study as we study our times. And I pray, Father, that, that sight can come. And Lord, you say in your word that, that we are to comfort ourselves and that we're to comfort one another. And that's what your word does. It doesn't cause faith, but it brings faith. Uh, it doesn't cause fear, but it brings faith in the heart of each and every born-again child of God. And I thank you, Father, for doing that tonight, causing faith to rise in each and every heart. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we believe. Amen. You can open your Bible tonight to the book of Daniel. And as I've said before, the book of Daniel is what I consider to be the central prophetic book of the Bible, and there are several. And when you study this book and get revelation from this book, it will help you to understand the other prophetic scriptures, the other prophetic books, because the other prophetic scriptures and books, in one way or another, are connected to this book. And you'll see that as we, as we continue to go forth in our study on this book. The book of Daniel covers a historical time period that the nation of Israel was in captivity in Babylon. The nation of Israel had been given commandments by God that they were to observe and to do certain things and definitely not to fall into idolatry and worship other gods, but to keep their covenant with God and to, to serve Him, to worship Him, to follow His Word. And 490 years before this time of captivity, they began to compromise. And the first step of compromise was that God had told them that every seventh year they were to allow the land to rest and to not grow food on the land. Well, there was one year that they just decided that they weren't going to obey the Word of God, obey the command of God. And so they just decided to plan on through. And from that step of compromise, then they compromised on many other things. And by the time we get to the end of this 490-year time period, they have gone deep into idolatry. And it came to the point, there was we, we found out that... Uh, when nations would um, go deep into sin, they also would go through different cycles of judgment. And the nation of Israel actually went through f five different cycles of judgment, which is what has happened to other nations as well. And each time that they went through these cycles of judgment, they were given a chance to change, they were given a chance to repent, they were given a chance to come back to God. And because they didn't do that, then God's hand of protection would be lift off, lifted off a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And the fifth cycle of judgment was that another nation would come into the nation that was going through those cycles of judgment because they had forsaken the ways of God. The nation would, uh, would um, come in and, and dominate over that nation. And uh, that was the fourth cycle. And then the fifth cycle was that they would take the inhabitants of that nation back to the nation that had captured them. And they would take them into captivity. And that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. They had a king by the name of Jehi Josiah. He was a good king, but then another king came along. He was a very bad king. And as a result of all of this compromise, after 490 years when God had been patient, God had been patient, God sent the prophets and different people like that to speak to them, to, to try to get them to go back to the Word, to try to get them to go back to the commands of God, to warn them. 
And after 490 years, it finally came to the point that the hand of protection was completely taken off of this nation. And Babylon came in, destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Babylon came in. And they, in the process of destroying the, the city of Jerusalem, there were, there were many people that were killed as well. But they, they saved 50 of the educated, 50 of the, the princes, 50 of the children. It was a total number of 50 of the elite bunch, uh, the, these young people that were in Israel. And they brought them back to the land of Babylon, and the idea was, let's, let's bring these educated ones, let's bring the noble ones back to Babylon, and we will send them through school for three years. And when we send them through our Babylonian school for three years, we will brainwash them. We will treat them very good, we will feed them the best food, we'll put them up in the best beds, We'll give them, you know, the, 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 the best. I mean, basically, it's just like, you know, what we've got going on in a lot of ways in our society. You don't have to work for a whole lot and, and it just get you a little piece of candy and, and everything is cool. And, um, and we've really had a lot of the same principle that has happened in many places in our school system today. It's called dumbing down to push an agenda. And so, so that's what that's what happened um, with with the nation of Israel is they ended up in this captivity. But the thing is, if if you know the promise of God, the promise of God all the way back to the time that Adam and Eve sinned and committed the the sin of high treason, where they they. Um, disobeyed God, God had told, the Lord God had told him, he said, when you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, you're going to die, and as a result of you dying, you're going to die, and what the, God was saying is that you're going to die spiritually, you're going to be separated from me because of sin, and then as a result of spiritual death, you're going to end up dying physically. Well, that wasn't God's uh, intention for man, God didn't want man to end up separated from him. God didn't want man to end up uh, even dying physically. But what happened? Adam and Eve, they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Bible says that man was not deceived. The woman was deceived and she was in the transgression. And after they sinned, the Lord God came into the garden. Adam and Eve uh, were hiding themselves from the presence of the Lord. They were, they were in shame. They were in guilt. They were in fear. And the Lord God came along and he gave them a promise. And the promise was that a Redeemer is going to come through the seed of a woman, and that Redeemer is going to take care of this sin problem. And so in the Old Testament, you have from generation to generation to generation this promise that is passed on that there's coming a Savior, there's coming a Redeemer, He's going to take care of this sin problem. And that's the reason that with the nation of Israel, which became the, the promised nation that the Redeemer would eventually come through, and that was a promise that was, it, it, it went from Adam to Eve, and then it went from generation to generation, all the way up to the time of Abraham, and then Abraham was told that he would have a son through he and his wife, Sarah, who could not have a child, and that son was Isaac, and Isaac was the first Jew. He was the first Jew that was born into the earth by faith, and then through the Jewish lineage from generation to generation to generation, the promise was, come, uh, was given that the Redeemer will come through your bloodline. And so that's the reason you see a lot of times that, that um, Israel would, would go into these captivities, and when they would go into these captivities, there was a remnant that was spared. It would go down to this little group, and, and, and God would look. You know, he would look, is there somebody left that believes me? Is there somebody left that believes my word? Is there somebody left that's still praying? Is there somebody left that is still seeking me? Well, you know what? 
There was. There was a prophet in the land. His name was Ezekiel. And uh, Ezekiel knew the word of God. And Ezekiel knew that the, the nation of Israel had forsaken God. He warned that nation. He warned them about their idolatry. And he developed basically a Bible school where people would come and they would learn the scriptures that they had at that time. And uh, he warned them, he prepared them, but, but at that time the nation of Israel had gone too far, they were too far gone. And, and so um, what, what happened then is that there were, there were four that would come into this class, and one of the four was a leader, you know, even though he was, he was young, there, there was something about him. There was something special about him. There was something special that Ezekiel noticed about him. And you know who that, one, that person was? That was Daniel. Hallelujah. Daniel was that young man that would come to Bible school, Ezekiel's Bible school class. He would sit on the front row of the school. He had his pen. He had his notebook. He had his Bible. He had his ears open. <laughs> I'm bringing this into modern times. But, but he was hungry. He was hungry for the Word of God. He, he had a love for God. He had a, a, a love for, for, the, for the command of God. He, he, was a, he was a person of character. He was a person, he was a young, young man of no compromise. And Ezekiel even recognizes, and we're going to see this in the scriptures, that Ezekiel even recognized the call that was upon Daniel's life in this Bible school. And so when the captivity came, Daniel was one of those that was spared. He, and, and there was 50. And out of the, the, the 50, there was only four of them. After they went through this Chaldean school, there was only four of them that did not compromise. Amazing. But you know what? God used <laughs> these four literally to to, to be this remnant that the promise could eventually come through. To be this remnant that God used eventually to bring other people to the Lord in that captivity. There were several people that, get, that did get saved during that time. And then God used those four eventually because of their, their um, lack, or not their lack, but because of their position of no compromise... Eventually, this nation was allowed to leave the captivity and go back to Israel, rebuild the city, rebuild their land, and dwell in their land. You imagine? Four out of this whole nation. It came all the way down to the point. Four left when they went into captivity that were ones of no compromise that are ones that chose to believe the word of God regardless of what anybody else did. And that's the kind of person that we want to be. It was such a powerful message last night that Pastor Stefan gave us about the word of God being the post. The Word of God being the post, the fear of the Lord. And, you know, in the Old Testament, they had the prophets. In the Old Testament, they had the temple. In the New Testament, we have the ministry gifts. In the New Testament, we have the church. And, you know, here, we just finished a complete series. And I encourage you, if you want to get some good teaching... Um, about the church right now, go and listen to the, pre to the previous series that I taught here in Germany about the seven churches that are mentioned in the book of Revelations. And remember what Jesus called those churches. He called those churches the golden candlestick. And the golden candlestick, one of the things that is represented in the golden candlestick is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Amen. And what's interesting, because, and this leads up to what we're talking about here with no compromise, but what is interesting is that in all seven of these churches, 
they didn't have names like we have today, you know, like Word of Faith Church and, and Every Nation Church, and our church is called from faith to faith to the nations. These churches literally were called the Church of Philadelphia, the Church of Ephesus, the Church of Sardis, the Church of... Um, you understand, these churches were actually... Uh, called the church of the cities that they were in, which goes to another level because the church needs to be a voice in the city. It is to be the foundation of truth for every city. It is to be the foundation of truth for every nation. Therefore, the church must hold on to the Word of God because once a church leaves the Word of God, they leave the whole standard of truth. And then, you know, the Bible says every nation divided against itself shall not stand. Every city divided against itself shall not stand. Every house divided against itself shall not stand. The church has got to be a candlestick in the city to provide the fear of the Lord. And the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. You understand? And it was the same way in the Old Testament with the prophets. They were the teachers of the word. They were the reminders of the word. The kings were to, you know, to go back and say, hey, to the prophets, what does the word of God say? What does God say about this situation? It's the same way. The church is supposed to be a voice in the city. This is right and this is wrong. And the church is to go back to the word of God always as the post. What does the Bible say is right and what does the Bible say is wrong? Wrong. That's the foundation for everything. Truth is the foundation for everything. Hallelujah. You understand? So, when we look at this book of Daniel, we're... coming into this time of captivity and during this time Daniel will go through three kings three kings there are three kings that will come in to Babylon I mean first of all the, the first king was was Nebuchadnezzar and uh, he actually came on the throne after he stopped by Jerusalem and took that city captive. His father was back in Babylon. He was in the process of dying, so Nebuchadnezzar had to run back and take the throne. So by the time that this elite group, 50, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, by the time they get back to or, or they're taken back to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar is the new king on the throne. Following Nebuchadnezzar, there will be another king that comes on the throne. And, uh, and, and, and then it'll end up with a king by the name of Darius. And uh, Darius is actually a king that is, is under Cyrus. And Cyrus is the one that God used to deliver them that they could go back to their homeland and dwell in their homeland and, and to rebuild. While Daniel is in captivity, he prays, he seeks the Lord, he seeks the scriptures, and he finds out that they're going to be there for 70 years. I mean, can you imagine being captive and you know what the Word of God says? And it doesn't look like there's any way that you're ever going to be set free. But you always go back to the scriptures. This is what God says. This is what God says. This is what God says. It looks like you're going to stay there for good. It looks like there's no hope for your nation anymore. It looks like it's over. But what happens? You go back to the Word. This is what the Word of God... We do the same today. We know what the Word of God says about our times. And when we know what the Word of God has to say about our times, we can always go back to it and say, this is what God says about our times. This is what's going to happen. And that's why it's important that we know the prophetic scriptures. So in this time of prayer, and in this time of vision and dream, even interpretation of dream for these 
kings, Daniel, found, he, he found out that there would be five different kingdoms that would come, and, and the first one was already in place, that would dominate over Israel. You understand? This is all in the book of Daniel. And the first one is the Babylonian kingdom, and then would come the Medo-Persian kingdom, then would come the Grecian kingdom, and, and we, we've heard of Alexander the Great, and then would come the Roman kingdom, and then would come the revised Roman kingdom. And that's the time that we're living in right now. The formation of the European Union is that revised Roman uh, empire. And, uh, and eventually that's going to go down to ten toes. You understand? It's in the process. And then when that kingdom is over, it's going to be over because Jesus is going to bring his kingdom to the earth. And so we're living at the last kingdom before Jesus comes to bring his kingdom to the earth. All of these things that Daniel saw here in this book have come to pass, and we're on the fifth one. Amazing. We're on the fifth one. And Jesus is going to come back. He's going to bring his kingdom to the earth, and he's going to rule and reign upon the earth for a thousand years, and we're going to come to rule and reign with him. All right, let's go to Daniel chapter 1. The time period that Daniel saw was a time period of 490 years. Years. Everybody say 490 years. Remember, they had 490 years of compromise from the time that they did not allow their land to rest and ended up heavily into idolatry. And when we talk about some of the idolatry that they were involved with, this was not little stuff. They were into some very serious idolatry by the time that this fifth cycle of judgment came. And so in this, Daniel was shown from the time of the captivity all the way up until the second coming of Jesus, 490 years of Jewish time. 400, well, you say, yeah, we're in this time now, and you're saying revised Roman Empire, and we're at the end, and, and it's been more than 490 years. Yeah, that's true. It has. Because when you look at Bible prophecy, particularly this prophecy here that we're studying, there, this period of time that we're studying, there are actually two clocks that are mentioned in the scriptures. There is what I call a Jewish time clock. And this Jewish time clock is this 490 years that is referred to here in this book of Daniel. But then there's another time clock. And that time clock is called church age time clock. This, all of this is in the period of man, or in the time of man. The time of man is around 6,000 years. The six days of creation represent that. A thousand years for every day of creation. A day to the Lord is a thousand years to man. And... There's, there's different segments in the Word of God. And if you ha heard our teaching that we did on end times and the church, you know that we went back and we, we looked at different dispensations. The Bible talks about different time periods or different dispensations. And in these different time periods, 
there would be a, um, a problem, there would be a, a forsaking of God, there would be, you could kind of like say a, a disaster, and then it was fixed, and then something new would start. And then they would come to an end, and, and there would be a problem, and, and then it was fixed. And then a problem, and then it was fixed. And from one dispensation to the next, to the next, to the next. That's one way to look at it. Another way to, to look at time is from Adam until Abraham, you have 2,000 years. For Abraham until the time of Christ, his earthly ministry was 2,000 years. And then from the time of Jesus to resurrect, and then the church age to start, to the end of the church age is 2,000 years. We also saw this, or see this in our teaching on the church in the end times, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, where it talks about the Good Samaritan pouring in oil and wine, oil being a type of salvation, wine being a type of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We found out that the man was laid on the road half dead, well, nobody's half dead. You're either dead or you're alive. But, but it's, and, and the Bible talks about how you, um, that the, the man that fell among thieves, he went from Jerusalem to Jericho. The whole picture there is a picture of the fall of man all the way up into the coming of Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's a prophetic teaching. And to fall among thieves is talking about the fall of man. And the curse is there mentioned as well, the, the threefold curse. Poverty is mentioned in that. Sickness is mentioned in that. And spiritual death is mentioned in that. The church uh, later on is mentioned in that. Where it says that, that um, the Good Samaritan, and we know the Good Samaritan to be Jesus, and he came along and he poured into the wounds of the man oil and wine, he bound up his wounds. He put the man on his own donkey. That has to do with going forward in the strength and the help of the Holy Spirit. He brought him into an inn, which was the church. And it says that he told the innkeeper, which is the Holy Spirit, you understand, that when I go away, if you spend any more, and, he's, and he talked about two days, if you spend any more, I'll repay when I come, which means that the, the two days or the two pence represents two days wage, which represents 2,000 years of time. And if the church would go over a little bit, there would be enough there to take care of how far we go over. We're not going to know exactly when Jesus comes. But what we are going to know is that we're going to know the time that the second coming is close to coming to the earth. And the, the way that we're going to know that is because the Antichrist system is going to be coming more and more into uh, its, its setting for the Antichrist to come into the earth. But the Bible teaches us that he cannot reveal himself while the church is here. We are the ones that are holding him back. Amen. And so... What about these two clocks then? You have this 490 year time period of Jewish time that Daniel was shown. And it starts at the captivity, Israel's captivity in Babylon. And it goes all the way up to the second coming of Christ. Well, here's the thing. And we're going to see this when we get to Daniel, the ninth chapter. Jesus... In all of this history, prophetic history time that is mentioned through the visions and the dreams of what Daniel wrote down, it goes all the way up to 483 years, and then Jesus is crucified. He's cut off, which means that there's seven years left. And that's where we get into the tribulation. When Jesus was crucified, that end time clock stopped. With seven years yet to tick off. You understand? And then you could say that the church age time clock, there was a click, and it's been clicking now for, we're at the 2,000 years. 
We're right there. So we're at the time that Jesus could come because we are at the end of the church age. And when we leave, then the Antichrist is going to take advantage of that little time that we are gone, because understand there are many Jews that are going to receive salvation, but it's going to take them a little bit. We're the ones that are the prayer warriors in the earth. We're the ones that are people of the Word. We're the ones that are saying, no, you don't. This is what the Word of God says, you understand. But what would happen if we would all leave at once? Then all of a sudden the resistance is gone. And that's when the Antichrist will start making his move. And at the middle of the tribulation, that's when he's going to come into the temple and say that he's Christ. And for those that follow the word of God during the tribulation, they're not going to be deceived. And there will be a lot of people saved during the tribulation. But I don't know about you, I don't want to wait around. <laughs> and I'm not going to wait around. We're, we're out of here. <laughs> Amen? So this is what we're going to look at as we go through this awesome prophetic book. So, let's look at verse 1. And we've already taught on some of these verses, so I'm not going to go into them in great detail. I gave you everything in a nutshell. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged. This was right after he had conquered in Egypt, and he was a general at that time. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim of Judah into his hand, or the hand of protection was lifted off. That was the fifth cycle of judgment. And we studied that out in our previous messages out of the book of Leviticus. It says... with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, or the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So they took the treasures out of the temple in Jerusalem and brought them into the treasure house of the chief God of the Babylonians. And his name was Baal, not Baal, but Baal, B-E-L. That was his name. He was the chief god. They brought these items from the temple in Jerusalem into the treasure house of this god called Baal. And the king spake unto Ashphanus, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel. So he said, I want you to bring not everyone at once. I want you to bring a few in the beginning. And his plan was to bring these educated ones, these noble ones, these princes, these children of the king into the land of Babylon, send them through school and brainwash them in the way of the Chaldeans. Get them to worship the Chaldean gods. Get them to go the way of the Chaldeans. You, you understand that the belief system of a nation is to be founded on God. It should be, as a nation, in God we trust. That should be the foundation. And this is what causes a nation to be strong. In God we trust. This is why Paul even writes to Timothy in the book of Timothy. He writes, the moral law is good. What does, he, what does he mean by that? He means that the governing laws of the nation are good because the governing laws of the nation go back to the word of God. And if the governing laws of the nation go against the Word of God, you have to go with the Word of God. That's why there are times that people had to go against the government. Because the government tried to get the people to go against the Word of God. The Word of God is the law. That's the foundation. 
You, you, you understand? And sometimes government forgets. It's supposed to be government by the people for the people. Sometimes they forget. They're working for us. We're the ones that put them there in, the, in our free society. But you see, there's other people that think that we are not educated enough to govern ourselves, and so we'll govern for you. You understand? That's, that's the two veins that you have. And, and God set this, you know, um, and we live in, in, in nations here and, you know, where I come from. That, that's the foundation of our nation. That it's supposed to be by the people for the people. And that's why it's important that people vote. And that's why it's important that people have a voice. And that's why it's important that people know what's going on and know what their government leaders are doing and hold them accountable. And who should hold them the most accountable? Just like in the Old Testament, the prophets. No, you don't. Today, it's the church. And this is why this is such an attack against the church. Do you understand? Because the church is the one that's supposed to put the fear of God in the land. The respect for God in the land to keep the standard, to keep the post. Yes. And this is why it's so important that the church stays with the word of God. Yes. Do you find what you believe in the scriptures? And if you cannot back up what you believe in the scriptures, then you really need to question what you believe. Yes. And we as individuals that are grounded in the Word of God, we have a right to say this is okay and this is not okay because we know this Word. And we must be a voice. The church must be a voice. And the church must be involved. And this is the reason that we got a lot of problems that we do in our society today is because the church has thought that it should not be involved. That's been Nothing but a lie that the devil has put in our lands. And so we leave the whole thing up to corruption. You understand? Ezekiel, he tried here. He got these, he, he got them together and he said, Hey, you guys, we got to get back here to the word. And he started teaching and he started teaching with the scriptures that, we, that, 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 he, that he knew. And he taught him, he said, this is why we are going through, through what we are going through. We've gone through these judgments because we have forsaken God. And then it came to the point that he knew that they were too far gone. And so he started preparing them to go into the captivity and not compromise. Amazing, isn't it? Remember John the Baptist? He spoke up to the king. He said, you're living in adultery. The relationship you're in, it's not okay. He wasn't afraid to say it. Jesus confronted many issues and he was not afraid to say it. And that is love. It's love for people, to protect people. And to keep freedom. Hallelujah. Somebody say something. So this king, now think about it. This king, Nebuchadnezzar, in the beginning, he said, you know, let's not start with the adults. Let's get the kids. Let's get the young ones. Let's bring them into a school system. Let's start with them. He said, number one, he said, this, this was his thinking, that, you know, if we take their kids, they're not going to come and attack us because they love their kids. But he said, these kids are, are not... So, so, so hard in their ways. They, you know, they haven't been hardened through life. It's experiences. And, and they were in idolatry, but they were in another form of idolatry. But it would be harder. You know, it's, it, there's, a, there's a statement that says it's, it's hard to train an old dog new tricks. 
I don't know if you guys have that here in Germany. But it was the same concept. And so we get these young minds and we're going to fill them full of our Chaldean ideas, our Babylonian ideas, our Babylonian system, our Babylonian ways. And then we're going to go get the other people and we'll bring them and it'll be easy for the transition to come. I'm telling you the same things going on in our world today. You take the word of God out of the education and you leave society up with no, with a, a, a lack of respect and reverence for God that has no standards. When the word of God says righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness. And this is why the church must be a voice. God holds the church accountable in the land uh, as to whether or not it's a voice. That's that candlestick. In the church is the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of knowledge. He's the spirit of wisdom. He's the spirit of counsel. He's the spirit of might. He's the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And remember, we saw last night, what is the fear of God? It's not that you're afraid of Him. But it's that you, you have respect for Him and you have respect for what He says is right and what He says is wrong. You understand? All right, let's take a five-minute break and we'll be back.